because I've been listening to this song, I have enjoyed it more and more that I've listened to it. How many of you have thought to yourself when you were listening, I'm still turning out too? Like, it's, it's not over for me yet. I feel like I'm still learning things, still growing, still developing. I, I love the reminder of this song that life isn't static. There's a progression to it that you can be involved with or you can be frozen in time. It, it kind of what leads people to say this, this gets said all the time, life is change. And most of you would probably agree with that statement. Um, is it safe to say that if your life isn't changing, that you're in a rut? Um, from my experience, I would say most people wouldn't agree with that statement. Because most people would identify a rut not simply as not changing, they would say, no, a rut has something to do with a circumstance that comes into your life that you don't care for. There's, there's a bit of suffering that goes with it. You're being asked to do something or go through something that you don't enjoy, and if you could exercise it out of your life, you would. That's a rut. And I, I think that's true. I think that kind of a suffering rut exists. And it's a little disappointing that that's the only type of rut that we see. Um, but I want to talk about it this morning a little bit because what happens when that type of rut sets in on our lives is oftentimes our first response to it is to isolate. We hide, we pull back, we don't go around other people, and we think if we just give it time, we can get this solved. If we could just get this out of our life as quickly as possible, as quiet as possible, then we can get back to really living. Hmm. Uh, it made me think of something. I grew up around a lot of animals. Uh, it's why I never want to have animals again. When I think of animals, I think of endless, constant work. That's what I think of, so I'm good. But my wife has this romantic idea of owning chickens in the future. Um, we had chickens. They poop on everything. It's hard to clean up. It's not a pleasant smell. It is a lot of work. Chicken, and, and what we found is that one of them would always start to act like it was King Kong. It would chase you around the barn and leap up at you and try to grab you with its claws and scratch you. People would be running in the, uh, the barn out in the paddock just screaming. You're like, dude, what is wrong with you? We eat their kind. Wait, like, you're training this thing to chase you down. I don't know. This might come as a, a helpful thing for you someday in the future, but you realize if you take a chicken that's doing that and hang it upside down off of your belt for 10 minutes, it'll realize who King Kong really is. It's not him. Now, I was told something about chickens that I remember when I was getting ready for this talk, and I went and looked it up. Turns out it's true. I was told that you cannot help a chick break out of an egg in that process of hatching if you do, you could harm it. Um, I found a little time-lapse video. It's 47 seconds long, so you can watch this happen. The actual time is 45 minutes. It takes 45 minutes for this to take place, but you're going to get to see it in 47 seconds. Here you go. I know, it's riveting. Yeah, there's a dramatic finish. Okay, now if your first response to that was, 
How did something that big end up in something that small? I felt the same way when I saw my first son born. I was like, what just happened here? But there was a doctor there. He explained it. I'm good now. All right. (laughs) But it turns out that chick is not fully formed and developed. Like it's so cramped in there that its stomach muscles haven't gotten nutrients and blood and all kinds of circulation. It hasn't moved at all. And that process starts that, kicks it off. And and we're not a patient people. Like you, you saw that for 47 seconds. How many of you are like, okay, somebody reach up there and break that thing open, right? That went on for 45 minutes. But if you don't, if you don't wait and you open that egg, the health of that chick is compromised. It's going to end up. In fact, this is what they say. It would be better for that chick to struggle to get out of the egg and not survive than for you to open up that egg and let it survive because its life is about to be full of misery and it will be short-lived if you helped it. That, that's what we're looking at here. Now, um, here's what's interesting. Most of us would associate the struggle that we just saw that chick with, with being in a rut. And that, he's stuck. He needs to get out of there. He needs to do whatever he can to get himself out of that place. Now, I want to be real careful. People are not chickens. You should not leave them alone in their struggle, and if they don't make it, well, it was better off that way, right? No, that's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is that there's two tendencies that we have when we watch people that we love struggle. One of them is we allow them to isolate. We allow them to pull back, they hide. We do this ourselves. And we believe that that's the best solution. But the other thing that's just as damaging is sometimes we try to remove the struggle from that person in our lives. This is especially hard for parents because parents see their role in this world as being protective. I'm supposed to come to your aid. I'm supposed to be your support. And all of that's right. All of that's true. You should do that. But when you conclude that I think this means my job should be to smooth out every struggle that you run into you may be doing a disservice because the learning, the struggling, the growth, the development that could have happened through that process gets taken away. Gets taken away. By the way, I, I kind of don't think this just happens with kids and students. I think we watch this with adults too. We are so quick to get away from difficulties in life that we don't get the lessons. We don't get the nutrients from that experience. We don't get developed the way that we should. Now, I told you um, at the beginning of this series last week that we were going to grab very specific ideas and talk about them, but that the truths would apply broadly. That's going to be so today because I'm about to try to make the case that I think you should allow or at least embrace the struggle in the lives of your kids and students for the sake of the long-term potential that it holds for them. So I'm gonna gonna talk about that very narrowly, but I really believe this has broad application across our lives in so many ways, okay? Now, this is not my idea, I stole it. The Apostle Paul wrote about this a long time ago and he was inspired by the Holy Spirit to say what he's about to say. In Romans chapter five, he's talking um, initially about finding glory in the hope of God. This, the idea of finding glory would be, you're excited, you're boasting, you're, you're um, embracing this idea of the hope of God. That makes sense, we could all get behind that. Embracing the idea of the hope of God. And then he says this in verse three, Not only so, not only the hope of God, but we also glory in our sufferings. What? 
I mean, who wants to hear that? I, I guarantee you the people of, that he was writing to at the time didn't want to hear that. If you understood what they were going through, his words are shocking. He's writing to the, to the church in Rome. And there was one point that, by the way, there's a lot of conflict in this church for one reason. At the time, uh, there was a Roman emperor who distrusted all the Jewish people, didn't matter if they were Christian or not Christian, and forced them outside of Rome. They had to move. If you want to do something miserable with your life, move, right? It's got to be in the top five, and we do it voluntarily. We do it to ourselves. Imagine going through something like that that somebody forced you to do. So they moved out of Rome. By this time, by the time Paul writes this, they were allowed to move back. They did not get their homes back. They did not get their businesses back. They started over from scratch. Life is hard. And while they were away, there were no Jewish Christians in that church. And so the Greek Christians formed the church to do like for them what they liked and enjoyed. And when the Jewish Christians came back, there were no Jewish customs going on in this church and they were going crazy. And there was a big fight over it. All of this conflict, all of this turmoil. And Paul said, I want you to find glory in this. I want you to embrace this. Be excited about this. It had to be hard to read. I, I can honestly tell you it's not easier to hear these days. It almost, it almost feels like crazy talk. You, you want me to find glory in the suffering of the people I love. Are you kidding? Is that what you're saying? You want me to find glory when a relationship is kind of falling apart, they, they lost a friend and they feel betrayed and they don't know how to process that, find glory. Or they're asking for some kind of help in school because they just can't get it done. And you want me to find glory with that. Or, or maybe they're struggling with depression, and it's not just about doing well at school. They're wondering if they want to do well with life. Find glory in that moment? Or they had a dream that they've been pursuing for a long period of time, and then it becomes apparent they will not achieve that dream. Find glory or they're dealing with a health problem or an issue where they're just sick and down and out and we find glory. Or they've just switched their major for the third time and they're adding years like they don't understand what it means, right? Find glory. Or they're not listening. They've been told over and over and over and they just won't listen to what you're saying and it's driving you nuts because you're repeating yourself so much. Find glory, or worse, they get older, and you're standing with them in a courtroom as they're figuring out where the boundaries are. Find glory. Uh, Tracy and I have five kids. We've had a lot of swings at the bat, and it hasn't gone perfectly in every one of those examples that I just gave you I've gone through. And I can tell you that in the early years, the first thing on my mind was not find glory. It was if I could smooth this over for them and get this out of their lives, they would be so much better off. And only over time, as we realized that sometimes the only way, the only way for you to learn is for you to face the consequences that you have in your life did we start to say, you know what? We're going, to, we're going to deal with this struggle in a different way. Instead of finding a way to remove it, we're going to find a different way to respond to it. Now, um, here's the thing. 
to be fair, Paul doesn't stop with fine glory and suffering. He goes on. He says this in the next part of verse 3. Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. He's not a sadist. He's not saying, hey, go enjoy suffering for the sake of suffering. He has this long-term vision in mind of what it could produce in somebody's life if they just stuck with it. He said, listen, this has the ability. I know in the immediate. I know in the immediate. It feels like it's suffocating you. It's taking your life and it's taking your air. But the long term, if they learn how to fight through that and get to the other side of that, they're going to come away with perseverance, with this ability to know I can survive this. I can push through this. I know what to do when I run into difficulties in life. Um, Probably one of the coolest mindsets on this was Thomas Edison. He was once asked about the invention of the light bulb, and he said this, I did not fail a thousand times. The light bulb was an invention that required a thousand steps. That's a perseverance mindset. That's somebody who's realized that, you know what, the only way that you can learn sometime is to step forward into a difficulty, realize you're not getting the best of it, and then you do it again, and you do it again, and you learn from that. But if you remove the suffering, you remove the ability for anybody to learn anything in the process, and they end up harmed. And he's not done here. He says this, it's not just that it produces perseverance. Perseverance produces character and character hope. It's a feedback loop. Said, so, hey, this thing, this thing feeds each other. You find some suffering, it develops perseverance. Perseverance causes you to develop character where you learn to trust God. You learn to know God. You learn to listen to God in the part of that. And because you've learned how to do that and you develop this character, you end up with hope. And that hope allows you to face something even more difficult and build, perse build perseverance. And it's a circle and you're like, who in the world wants to feed that kind of loop? That's, you want to escape this thing, not feed this loop. Are we insane? I'm not trying to encourage you to go out and find some suffering. I've lived long enough to know that in a world that's been so harmed by sin, it will find you. You'll not choose it. And the only choice that you will have is how you will respond to it. Can I make just this simple observation? I've watched people who have gone through these suffering ruts. I've watched the people who love them at the same time, too. And what I've noticed is something interesting. Sometimes the whole group of people develop anger, bitterness, and resentment. And it's led me to conclude this. Suffering is not a neutral player. It always produces something. It has the ability to produce perseverance, character, and hope. But it could also produce resentment, bitterness, and anger. And what you do with it makes all the difference in the world. And how you train your kids for it will make all the difference in the world. So I want to offer up a few ideas. I just want to offer up a few things that you can process as you're entering into this season where, like, they're going to happen. Like, as kids go into school, these, these difficult seasons happen, and you have to decide how you're going to enter into that with them. Okay? So um, I want to give you this first idea. Offer or accept, if you're in a different place, offer or accept the very thing that God offers to us as human beings, presence. Offer and accept the presence of people in your life. Uh, this is how uh, God talks about what he does with us. This is Hebrews 4.16. 
Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in our time of need. God's available. If, if you don't make the first mistake and withdraw, which is what we often do, and what's so funny about that is when we withdraw, we often think that we're just withdrawing from other people. Often, God gets thrown in the mix and we withdraw from everybody. See, one of the things that God does is he uses his people in the, each other's lives. And when you withdraw, you withdraw from God's ability to enter into your life in a meaningful way and to be with you. To do what? Mercy and grace. It's right there. By the way, if you've wondered, what in the world do I do if I have to go and just simply be with somebody, you offer them mercy and grace. But don't make this mistake. See, where, where this gets difficult is we see at the end of this verse where it says God will help us in our time of need. And most of us interpret that to mean that God will take this issue away. And can I tell you, that is where most of the anger, bitterness, and resentment comes from. That I people see who go through these suffering ruts. They expected God to deliver an easy path. And what he offered was his presence. No, I'm going to be with you. I'm going to offer you grace. I'm going to offer you mercy. But I know what's at stake here. If you don't develop perseverance, you won't develop the character that you need. You won't have the character to develop the hope that will save your life. So I'm just going to be present with you. I'm not going to remove this from you. And that's hard for us to hear. And that's hard when we show up as friends, as parents, in the lives of somebody who's suffering. Because we almost feel like my presence means that I'm responsible to remove the suffering that they're going through. That's not what it means. By the way, I think this is tricky. It's why having a developed relationship with God becomes so important because you have to have the radar on to listen because there are moments, there are times where God will use you to bring relief to that other person that will allow you to do something that could help that. But many times it's simply your presence. You are not responsible to remove them from that suffering. And when you do, You harm them. They don't learn. They don't develop. They don't get those muscles going that they actually need to be able to stand on their own at some point. And so your presence is enough. By the way, can I just, I just say this. You want to know one of the biggest mistakes I think we make in this area of presence? You have to do it before it gets bad. You have to be hanging out with your kids, doing stuff that are fun and enjoyable and engaging so that they develop a relationship with you so that when a suffering moment comes, it's normal and natural in their mind to think, I should seek them out. This, this is what we do. This is what we do in friendships and other relationships. To think that all of a sudden it will happen when it gets bad, that's not the way it works. It's never worked that way. You ought to consider the gift of presence. And if you're in a suffering rut, you ought to accept the presence of others and God in your life. It has the ability to make a difference. How? Mercy and grace. Mercy and grace from the hand of God. Second thing. Now, this one's going to be a little harder, for, so let me explain it. I'm convinced that you should discipline with consistency. And if you're like, what in the world does that have to do with ruts? I think it has everything to do with ruts, and I'd like to try to explain it. So in Proverbs chapter 3, it says this in verse 11. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. Do not resent his rebuke. For most people, we have an idea of discipline that's wrong. We think it's about punishment. We think it's about control. It has nothing to do with that. You want to know what it has to do with? Look at this next verse. 
because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son he delights in. It's love. Out of love, you discipline. Now, this is not fun. In fact, if you go and read, she's just going to put it up on the screen, Hebrews 12, 11, it will tell you that in this moment, in the season of discipline, there's nothing pleasant about it. In fact, if you find somebody who likes discipline, that's a scary person, right? That's a scary, that's somebody who enjoys something weird. This is unpleasant for both people, the person who's doing it and the person who's receiving it. But here's, here's what you could say. That discipline is a momentary, small window of suffering. It's something that you could take away from them and make their lives better immediately if you wanted to. And by the way, a lot of people do it. They lay down a boundary. They go to hold that person to the boundary. And when it gets uncomfortable, they just go, ah, never mind, I didn't mean it. I want you to understand what you're doing. You are training that child, that student, to not figure out how to go through difficulties in life. They're not learning the skills. You know, you know how you find a way to develop perseverance through suffering? You learn it through discipline as a kid. Somebody disciplines you, you accept that. You persevere through that discipline. You learn something, you've developed a skill. And when you take away, when you take away, by the way, I watch adults do this all the time too. They do it to themselves. You're given a boundary. Follow this boundary. And you don't want to put up with this for so long, so you skip over as much of it as you can and you just go back to the way life was. At some point, you will have to learn the lesson. And you get to choose these little moments of artificial suffering for your kids and students. It's what, they, it's what it is. Nobody's having a good time. But you're teaching them that perseverance gets them somewhere. If I persevere, I could end up with character. I could end up with some valuable things here. And yet we sacrifice it because we don't want them to feel bad. We want to take away that thing that we know we can take away. We want to make the road smooth. You're training. You're training them. And students, I know you're sitting here going, oh man, we don't need this. Like, no, you do. You, you ought to welcome it. Because it's a long-term vision for your life, not a short-term one. A long-term vision for your life means that you're going to be able to deal with suffering of other kinds. You'll persevere. You'll get stronger. And because of that, you'll develop character, and that character will lead to hope. But it all starts early. And I'll just tell you right now, this is the truth. If they don't learn it under your care, they will learn it from somebody else and it will be far more painful than you can ever imagine. Because our society still works with boundaries and we enforce them with laws. And if people don't think that the boundaries count towards that for them, they will run into a place where it will. And it will be painful. You have an opportunity to have the long-term vision of your kids in mind. And instead of running from suffering, maybe you should find glory in the opportunity to develop them for the long term, the long haul. Because God's out to, he's out to be present with them in the midst of their suffering, but if they never learn how to suffer, they'll miss the presence of God. How do you adjust your course toward Christ if every time you experience suffering, you withdraw? Th this is the task. And you have a chance. You have a chance to make a difference because I, I do believe 
we're all still turning out. God is in the process of developing us. And if you could change your view of suffering, if you could change how you were interacting with it, how you were stepping into it in your life, you could make the difference in their lives and maybe in yours too. Let me pray with you. God, uh, so many people get upset with you um, because you don't, you don't simply just remove the difficulties that we face in life. You're capable of doing it. But we live in a world that has been so tainted by sin, there is going to be repeated opportunities for us to, oh, find really difficult ruts, things that we're going to struggle through. They're not going to be fun. And yet what's amazing is that you've created a system where we could enter into a process with you that that junk, that junk that we face in our life could end up turning into hope. But it starts with instead of running away from it, we persevere. Instead of pulling somebody out of it and smoothing it over for them, we let them figure out how to persevere. We're present with them. God, will you build perseverance in us that leads to character, that leads to our hope in you. You, you are our only hope in this messed up world that we live in that's full of so much pain. But we can do it with you. God, will you give parents the courage to draw boundaries and hold them knowing that the future is what they're fighting for. Give us wisdom. We really do want to adjust our course towards you as we go. In Jesus' name, amen.